We are 22S Radio, the next wave of K-Beats. 22S Radio is 22SMedia.com and 88.1 FM KKJZ HD3 Long Beach, Los Angeles. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Golden Spotlight. Yes, I'm your host, Rob Flores, and we are here at Cal State Long Beach University. At this time, I'd like my guest to please introduce herself. Hi there, thank you for having me. My name is Joanne Chu. Excellent. Now, uh, one of the things I like to do when I have my guests is I like to, you know, have them share their story, starting first from the beginning. Let's start off first with, like, you know, sure. what was life growing up? Uh, did you have siblings? What was K-12 like? Uh, let's see. So I'm originally born and raised in San Francisco. I had one, I have one older sister. And growing up, I guess, it was kind of interesting because I always felt like even when I was with my best friends, I felt like I didn't quite belong, because um, I grew up in a very traditional Asian community, so I, I'm sure like the stereotypical stuff people's familiar with, it's just, you know, the very well-behaved Asian kids who are good at piano, violin, ballet, they get good grades, they're very obedient. Um, I tried to go down that route, but it was just always tricky, like it didn't feel like it was a fit for me. So that was kind of my experience growing up. Yeah. Cool. Now, um, I always ask my guests, yeah. you know, um, everyone has that one class that they either disliked or, you know, the, it was their least favorite. What, what was that subject for you? My least favorite class. It's ironic because of what ended up happening. Um, my least favorite class was PE, but I ended up becoming a runner, and I run marathons now, so it's kind of like funny how that came about, because I wasn't the most coordinated kid or athletically gifted, and um, like I come from a family of very gifted runners. Like on my mom's side, everybody, they ran, they, they came in first. Um, when they ran races while they were growing up in Taiwan. And they lived in a poor village, so the fastest runners would get free school supplies. So everyone in my, my mom's side of the family, they never had to pay for school supplies. It was always given to them. So it was kind of tricky. I fell into running, and people thought I would be a natural at it because uh, that's what my mom was. But I actually struggled. I struggled a lot with um, athleticism and coordination. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, did you get to participate in clubs and stuff during uh, K-12? Um, let's see, what clubs? Not a whole lot, like I, I ran track in high school, that was just my main focus. Uh, but how I fell into acting was, um, I was like struggling through school and I needed a credit, like an easy A. So my friends were like, why don't you just sign up for the theater class? You know, it's like, and I was like, okay, I'll go on and try that. But I ended up loving it so much. And my instructor at the time, his name was, his name's Mr. Drain. I hope he's still teaching. But, um, you know, he was the first person who put the idea into my head because he says, oh, who knows what you guys can do with what you learn here. Some of you might go on to become actors and actresses. And then that was kind of when the light bulb went off. And I was like, oh, we can actually try and do this for a living because it was the first time where I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing because like just growing up I always felt like I didn't fit in but I felt like this it felt like aligned and very natural like it made me excited to get started and to keep doing it. Cool, cool. Now um, did you get to uh, you know, try that with friends and stuff like how did that come about to, you know to work the courage to do all that? Uh, let's see, to be honest, uh, my friends and family, initially, they weren't too happy about it when all of a sudden I was like, okay, I'm going to become an actress now. Um, like, I have, some, like, my best friends, they're very supportive now, but I remember they were like, you were going to be a veterinarian, and now you're going to move away and become an actress, and my parents were not happy about the decision at all. My dad actually said, you need to go to college for at least two years before we're going to let you go, and they kept trying to, like, delay it, but I was like, <laughs> it was the first time I got really excited about something, like, even though it like it wound up being so much it's a lot of hard work um but it's still something that excites me 
Um, Because as soon as I turned 18, I was like, okay, I'm going to save up and I'm going to move to L.A. And this has to happen now. And I was like chomping at the bit and I was like, I need to get out there. And like looking back, I can appreciate that my parents tried to keep me back as long as possible. Like, I get the time. I was like, why are you doing this to me? I need to be rebellious. I need to get out of here. But now I can appreciate they were just trying to be protective. (laughs) No, I always ask my guests, you know, uh, senior year can always be... uh, well, senior year is said to be the most stressful in high school. Oh, what yes. What was that year like for you? Oh, my God. I'm like, I feel like it prepared me for life out here um, in, in acting because I went to a very competitive academic high school, and so it was just really stressful. I always felt like I was um, in a pressure cooker, but I just remember struggling with grades. Um, I actually, I fell into depression a little bit in high school just because I was trying to fit a mold that was clearly not me and it was before I had discovered acting and my only outlet at the time was running. So it was, I remember senior year, it was, it wasn't easy, it was just, in my head I was like you just need to get through this and after that you can kind of move on with your life. But. I just remember it wasn't it wasn't the best time for me actually. <laughs> yeah. So as a uh, uh, senior year is wrapping up, did you get to like attend all the stuff like prom and, and all them activities? I and did. Stuff? I wasn't gonna. I didn't want to go to prom, but like I had some really good friends. They set me up and they got me a date, and they're like, "You guys, you are coming. You are enjoying this. This is supposed to be like a milestone event because it's one of like they said, you know, these are the best years of your." best years of your lives like you don't want to miss this but so I ended up having a good time so I did get to do all of that you know end of the year the stuff that you want to the memories that you want to take with you like all of that got to happen yeah so as senior year is wrapping up people ask themselves you know what's next Uh, like what's cool and all that what was that transition period like it was honestly I felt a little scared because I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Because at first I was like on the track of like, oh, I was going to go down the medical route or study law or something, like something that your parents like want you to do. And then all of a sudden it's just like in my head, I was like all of this stuff about taking acting classes and auditioning and headshots. It was like this whole new world that I was just so excited about and I wanted to learn as much as possible and like dive into that. But at the same time, it's just... Um, family and friends were like, are you sure you want to do this? It's really cutthroat. It's going to be really hard. Um, But at the time, I was just, I was scared and excited at the same time, if that makes any sense. (laughs) Well, I got to only take one class, but I loved Mm -hmm. it. I I did try uh, an acting class. Nice. What was very interesting, I think, you know, I would like you to tell us about the, you know, okay. (laughs) I'm trying to, to, to remember all this, but Okay, I love the whole part where you get assigned a script and, you know, you get it to your character and, you know, you're going to memorize your line and then you're going to go for it. Yeah. I sucked at the exercises. Oh, right. <laughs> like, the ones where, like, let's mm-hmm. say you're in a big group, right? Mm-hmm. And like, I'm, like, trying to remember all, all this. All of a sudden, thing, you're, like, like um, you have to, like, maybe remember the person's name in the circle, right? Mm-hmm. Or, oh, like, the perform, improv games yeah, or, like, the exercises, you have like, to, like, the perform ice breakers, yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, point at the next person, mm-hmm. but then... If that person points at you, you have to remember that exact yeah. expression, phrase, whatever. Oh, yeah. like we and did a lot of that in improv right classes. Yeah. And, yeah, it's tricky because it's like, oh, it's like you're all in a circle and it's like one person says his name is Bob and then it's like the next guy is Steve and when they get to you, you have to say, you know, uh, my name is Rob, but then you have to remember all the people beforehand. It's like Rob, Steve, and then you get all mixed up and it's like, yeah. Yeah, tell us about the different types of those. Like... Oh, and when I, t- when I took improv classes, um, and I'm, s- I'm still um, active in that, it's just, I try to just let go and not worry about it too much. Because I was the same way when we had some of those games, like the brain teaser games, and we're kind of like, ah, but I think that's um, what, like the purpose of it, it's just to get people to loosen up and to, you know, to laugh and not take yourself too seriously and to be uninhibited because I think that's when the best work comes out. It's like when the most natural, spontaneous moments is when you're, you know, you're not trying to be perfect and you're not trying to like, you're not so consumed with 
getting it right. And I feel like that's something we can, like a lot of people struggle with, regardless of what field you're in. It's just like we have to get this right and we have to do this. And it's like it takes all of the spontaneity and all of like the the naturalness and the magic out of the moment. How about um, so like. I remember also, like, even in broadcasting in one of the radio classes, like, they'd give us a, a real script. You know, these were all scripts that have been, you know, aired throughout the, yeah. the years and stuff. And it's funny because, like, my advisor, my professor would always give me, like, the, the role of the grandkid. <laughs> like the kid, and I'm, I'm going out with Grandpa to go to, one time, uh, the one I remember the most is me and Grandpa are going to, like, a restaurant, mm -hmm. and it's, it's all of a sudden something like, hey, you want steak sauce, Grandpa? It's great! And, like, because, you know, I, I don't have a deep voice, so, mm -hmm. like, if, if people only hear my voice, you know, they wouldn't uh, imagine I'm in college. <laughs> So, so like, 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 were you? Are you saying like you got typecast yeah. into a certain? I mean, that that does tend to happen a lot. Um, but like, because that you have like the voice that you have, and we've been speaking, like, it's a very good segue into voiceover work if that's something that you're interested in, because you can do a lot. Like, you can voice a lot of the cartoon characters and everything, because that's what they're actually looking for people like that. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually adorable. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, what kind of um, um, challenging roles and stuff? Or what was your earliest roles? Um? When I first got, this is this is actually hilarious. So when I first moved to LA, I started booking lots of serious, dramatic, heavy, heavy roles. Um, I did like again here. Here we go with typecasting. Um, I booked a lot of human trafficking, sweatshop girls. So like my first, my early roles, it was like a lot of getting locked in a cage, getting kidnapped, or like getting beaten up, or like we die or something. It was like a lot of really heavy stuff, and it was kind of funny because people know me to be like this kind of goofy, I'm kind of goofy and awkward and clumsy, like a funny person. So it was kind of strange to have to jump into that, but when, you, when I first got out here, I was just like so hungry to get started. I was like, I just want to work. So I like, I did a lot of those roles and it was kind of tricky breaking out of it. Um, like I have an excellent acting coach, her name's Amy Linden. And she was the one that noticed early on that I had a knack for comedy. And she was, she was always trying to push me to explore that and to strengthen my comedic skills. Cause she was always telling me, um, if you can do comedy, you can do drama, but not every not every dramatic actor can do comedy. It's like a, a different transition. So she pushed me really hard to work on my comedic skills for a few years after that, because I was like, I got to the point where I was like, I cannot be dying in a cage anymore. Like I can't, everything I do, I'm like crying, or it's just like, it was a very, like, I was so thankful and grateful for the opportunities, and it was a great way to work out my emotional vehicle, but it got to the point where I was like, I cannot keep being depressed all the time, because I was starting to really get depressed. So I've been very lucky to, I feel like, just in the last year recently, like, I've started to, like, break into the more comedic roles, and I, I love doing both, so I'm hoping I can transition back to drama, but the two projects that I've been working on right now, um, Three Chen Sisters and Destroy by Fire, they, like, they had, um, we've both been blessed with genius writers, the scripts are both hilarious, so I'm just having a lot of fun exploring that side of everything. How about, like, um, a role where I guess it's, like, so far away from, like, who you are and mm -hmm. stuff, like, um, like, I remember a professor gave me, you know, like, a, okay, he gave me a script of, of this one guy, uh, it was, a uh, what's that called, where you, you're the only one that has lines, it's just you mm -hmm. by yourself. A monologue? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it was, uh, Fishing by Michael Waller or something mm -hmm. like that, and it was this one character that's, like, he's very intense and, like, um, like, I don't, I remember when I took broadcasting, like, we would, like, watch documentaries of, like, the black and white, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, like, performers of Silent Era, and, you know, uh, once they got to, like, comedians like Abbott and Costello, and, like, yeah. a lot of the earlier actors and like, comedians mm -hmm. like that, there was really, like, no cursing. I'm like, I, I never, like, cursed, you know, at the time, or anything like that, and, like, all of a sudden, I was like, there's a curse word in this group. Oh, and it's, like, such a far departure from who you are. Mm -hmm. That's actually, it's something that I feel like 
my way of going about it has evolved over the years of, as I've trained and I've kept learning. Because I remember, like, in one of my first acting classes, like, um, the teacher just gave us a script, and this was, like, years and years ago, and it was, like, I was, like, 17 at the time, but it was about this lady who's, like, a prostitute, and she's, like, cussing, and she's, like, you know, jumping on men. It's, like, let's... Oh yeah, I, oh, yeah, it's words I cannot say on air. Let's just say that. And I was, like... I at the time I was just I didn't have that much to draw on so I was just mimicking what I had seen on TV or what I had seen other actors do and as I've slowly uh, learned more and trained more I just feel like no matter what parts you get to play or what's thrown at you even if it's like a crazy serial killer which we are not we obviously not in real life um, the fun part and also one of the challenges is just to find, because um, there's something, there's like a common thread that ties us all together, and it's just like, what can you find of yourself in this character, and to just build on that, just to make sure everything is rooted in truth and coming from a very honest place, instead of just, you know, trying to do it how people think it should be done. I know that... Uh don't know the terminology, no but I know that uh, you know that there's like certain actors who are like before they get into their character, they will literally like commit to the character like way before they even had to go ahead and go film and stuff. Yeah. And like they're like, wait, you're like a whole different person right now. Oh, like, like method acting yes. or something. Like oh, if you're playing a serial killer, if you're not, if you're in the script, it says you haven't slept in three days. You really don't go to sleep for three days, like that type of stuff. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I mean, I do know a lot of actors that are like that. I, I don't really know if I, if I do that because I don't know. I'm not sure if like I would be like if I had to like live in isolation or if I had to like put myself into a really crazy state of mind. Um, I always try to keep my personal life separate so that like I like that's just me like when the cameras stop rolling I go back to I go back to being myself even if it's like you know doing a crying scene or some really heavy emotional scene because I've had friends who like when we're filming if I have to do something really heavy I'm like okay you need to like go over there because you're making me laugh and you make me happy and I need to not be happy right now like I always have to make sure that there's just like a line that's just how I do it but I was just like there's just so many ways people get into character and how they connect it's that's one of the exciting things about acting and artistry because it's just everybody the way our brains are wired and just the way that we see the world like we get to bring all of that into into it because like you and I can watch the same movie but we'll probably have a whole different interpretation of it I noticed how um you know, it, it's always cool to, you know, read online and mm -hmm. stuff, like, behind the scenes yeah. and stuff. Uh, but it was very interesting to read about, like, how, you know, the most recent two, um, okay, well, one of them was Suicide Squad, but then the other was, was The Dark Knight. But yeah. The, the most recent two Jokers, like, how intense it was. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the first Joker, like, he, you know, he passed away. Yeah. But the other one, uh, what I found interesting was that they apparently, um, were worried about like how he got too much into being Joker that mm -hmm. he had to like they were worried sure about his yeah that he was see the therapist like before every like mm -hmm. take or something like that it's like wow yeah I mean I admire the actors that go that far um, I mean like I I mean I've had to play some heavy roles in the past but it was I felt like I was always able to come out of it. So, I mean, that's, I always feel like that's a danger of, um, it's possible to like throw yourself into a role so much that you kind of get lost or, this is actually like remi reminding me something of um, like um, an acting class, like for the last couple months, like my teacher has been trying to um, get me, she's trying to push me to be more emotionally uncensored and I think one of the challenges is like if you need to take yourself to a dark place like because I'm always like I have to like draw a line because I'm always like afraid to cross that line like what if I go to a dark place that I cannot get out of but I also think that's one of the risks that we have to we have to be willing to take when the opportunity arises but also to know that 
we need to also take care of ourselves, like our physical, our emotional help. So if there's resources available, like therapists and everything, I'm, I'm glad that they have that. Like I feel like everyone should take advantage. I think it's so cool, you know, like um, there's so much aspects that go into acting. And I remember like when I first took the acting class, like I wanted, I wanted to go more, but like obviously when you're in college, you gotta focus on just your major. Yeah. But it yeah. was interesting because I was trying to, uh, uh, there was a time where I was like curious, like, oh, like, what, how do you get into like film and stuff? But then uh, I was like, oh, but I don't want to take these other classes because, <laughs> like, I, I was like, I'd rather go straight to the acting. But mm -hmm. then, like, you realize, no, if you want to major in acting, you do the whole lighting, you make, uh, mm -hmm. you got all these other classes that you still have to take if you want to get the degree in that field. Yeah, it's like very interesting. Like, you got to know behind and in front. Of That's the camera. kind of what was happening because when my dad was like you need to go to college for at least two years before we let you move to LA um, like I was so excited about the acting aspects of it and like the whole behind the scenes stuff like it's something that interests me now because I want to learn all about um, producing and directing but at the time I can connect with uh, where you were at I was like I just want to take the acting classes I have to like take all this other stuff and I'm like I just want to like get to this part and I was just so impatient as a kid um, yeah I actually I dropped out of college because oh. I wanted to move to LA and just get to the acting part of it so badly and at the time I was like I was like I had a 4.0 GPA so my parents were happy about that um, but I actually convinced my dad to let me go to work full time so that I could save up money and go to LA. And he was just like, at the time, he was like, okay, I'm done arguing with you. It's like, I'm gonna, fine, just do it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, obviously, you know, like the, the whole idea for actors is to make their way to, to LA, obviously. Mm -hmm. But like um, the journey, you know, uh, to like just getting known and stuff, like obviously, in the acting world, your resume is your headshot. For, for those that don't know what a headshot is, tell us all about that. Well, I feel like it's changed a lot in the last couple years because of um, everything's online, everything's gone digital. Because I know the old school way, it's like you have your 8x10, your headshot, it's like um, your, your photo, and then you have your resume on the back. And then it's like your agent or manager, they will like, actually, they used to like fax things over. Um, to, to the breakdowns and everything and that's how they that's how they try to get you auditions and you know you go to the auditions and then you bring your headshot and your resume and then you give it to the casting director or to the producer whoever's there so they have a way to contact you but now everything's so digital because everything's mostly online like the top the top three acting websites um, actors access LA casting Casting Frontier, it's like you upload all of your uh, headshots, you upload your resume, you upload your real clips, like everything, it's online. And you know, if you have an agent or a manager, they are connected to that, and that's how they submit you now. And it's kind of crazy, because now that everything's digital, because I also have friends in casting who like explain the process to me a little bit. Like, so your agent gets, every day they get sent what they call um, the breakdowns. So that's basically what's casting, like the TV shows, the movies, that's what are out there. And then uh, your agent will go through and like they'll go through their roster and they'll say, oh, okay, Rob is right for this, so I'm gonna submit his info to the casting director. But now that everything's digital, they can get flooded with like thousands of submissions. And it's like they have to comb through all of that and they try to narrow it down to like 30 or 40 people that they're gonna call in for auditions and then you know they go from there. So that's kind of how it's changed in the last couple of years. Like I feel like it's a bit, of, it's very easy to get bombarded um, and oversaturated right now because there's just so much out there. <laughs> I know I had a, a guest uh, in the past who, mm -hmm. who did mention a, a bit about acting and I totally forgot to get a follow up on, on, on this but um, she had said mm -hmm. that there's actually like certain colors that, that a person wears that yeah. like uh, casting people uh, like um, when they come to audition. Oh, well, it's mostly, there's certain colors that I know they don't want you to wear because um, is if, if they film you, it's not going to look good on the tape. Like they generally tell us to stay away from like white because it's going to wash you out. Um, black, it's just going to be too dark and also 
um, we're often discouraged from wearing red for some reason. I can't. I'm, it's just like I, I guess it's just like the way it transfers um, onto the tape. Like it, it's just like skin tone, or it's gonna just be really distracting. Mm. Yeah, but like. Like I've also talked to some photographers, like my friends who do headshots and stuff, and because now the way that casting directors get their submissions, um, they, and it's like all of, it's like so many thumbnails, it's like your head's going to be like on a thumbnail that's like this big, so they always try to like use bright colored backgrounds or whatever to like make you stand out and, you know, help increase your chances of getting called in. Another thing I heard also is, you know, the whole idea that you know, when you do a headshot, uh, you shouldn't like. Uh, how is it? it? It's just you the way the way you are. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like it, if you wear glasses, keep the glasses on or something like that. Or it's just it needs to be um, an honest representation of who you are. Because casting directors, their number one pet peeve is they call someone in and then they come in and they look nothing like their photos. Like they hate that. They get really mad. And it's just from my experience, they want, they prefer it to be more natural. They don't want it to be too airbrushed or whatever. Like it just needs to look like you on a good day, and that's because um, that's who they're that's who they're ultimately going to hire. So it's just something that captures your essence of who you are. You know, I think one of the things I was always curious about is what if somebody, like, uh, they, they did their headshot, right? And yeah. they had, like, super long hair, and all of a sudden they, they, like, have super short hair also. Oh, well, they then you off. have to, like, the, it's your responsibility to, if your look changes for whatever reason, like, if you cut your hair or if you're, you grew out your hair or you gain a lot of weight or you lose a lot of weight, like, you always need to make sure, it's, like, part of the actor's job is just to keep their materials um, always updated, always current. Yeah, I try to, I try to like shoot at least once a year. Yeah. What about pricing wise? Uh, how expensive is it to get headshots and stuff like that? It can. I mean, I, I, I mean, it, it does get pricey because you can't. There are photographers that are, uh, they're very talented and they're reasonably priced but then when it gets the thing that gets really expensive is just uploading them onto all of the sites right now that the sites that we need to be on that our agents and managers used to submit us through so it can get really pricey um, but I think the ballpark of what I've been paying lately was between three to seven hundred depending on the photographers yeah because it's just you you get what you pay for you want to make sure that your photos and everything they represent you in the best way possible because that's what's going to get you called in how early does someone like or when does someone have to start thinking about an agent it it depends because um that's a really good question actually um there is a lot of leg work that we can do on our own to get out there and get parts on our own um, you know build because it's all about building relationships so it's just that stuff that we can constantly work on and agents and managers they come at a they can come at different times for everybody because sometimes it's just like you get scouted or you get spotted and you know you get signed right away or you know somebody that'll send you a referral or you start reaching out to people on your own so it actually depends and it's just you're like the journey with agents is it's going to constantly be changing because it's just you're going to get to a point where you need to switch agencies or find somebody else or you know it's like relationships sometimes they don't work out so you always need to constantly be ready to you know roll with the punches and whatever happens so that's like something that's like constantly changing but it's different for everybody but in general it's helpful <laughs> if you know you have a few credits you can try to, you know, like get together and do student films or make films with friends on your own to create your own content. So like it's always helpful just so that you have something to show people. I always ask my guests, where do you see yourself after retirement? Well, I hope I, because I love acting so much, even though it's like the hardest thing I've had to do. Um, I hope I don't have to retire. Like I want to do this until the day I die, God willing. <laughs> I always ask my guests, what would you like your legacy to be? Let's see. That's a really good question. Um, because what I was always looking forward to when I get to where I want to be in my career, I was, 
I want to be able to start charities and organizations to give back. So I hope that's that's something that I'm going to, I mean, okay, I need to be positive about this. This is something that I will get to um, somewhere down the line in the future. Because one of the actresses that's inspired me most, um, Audrey Hepburn, because she was such, she's so beautiful and she was so talented, but all of the humanitarian work that she did after, you know, afterwards in the second mm -hmm. stage of her life and when her career wound down, like that's something that I hope I would like to, I would I want to get into just to be able to just to give back to the community and just because I feel like it's it's a cycle because people have been so supportive I've been very lucky with the people that are in my life to push me forward so that I can keep working on making my dreams come true like I want to continue that and you know give platforms to other people because I've always dreamed of let's see um, helping underprivileged children, and I want to start animal charities and everything like that. So that's kind of what I hope my legacy will be. How can people contact you? I, you can find me online. I'm on Instagram, um, Joanne J. Chu, Facebook, Twitter, like everything, everything's the same. So anyone's welcome to contact me there. Spell it. Joanne, oh, J-O-A-N-N-E-J-C-H-E-W. <laughs> Perfect. Now, obviously, you know, to, to be able to go to casting and, and everything like that, um, like people um, like end up having to like uh, save up or, or, or balance mm -hmm. regular job at yes. the same time. Tell us about your journey. It, that is probably the most challenging part because we have to, you know, Acting, I feel like, I, like from my experience, I'm just going to be really honest about it. I feel like it's been trying to support a child on a single person's salary. Like it's that expensive. Um, and it's just, I don't want to dis be disrespectful to people that are single parents and trying to raise children on their own. But I felt like this, my career has been my baby. It's like, because it is, it does get really expensive and we have bills to pay and we have to make rent and it's just we have to pay for our headshots and we have to pay for our classes and that's probably been the most challenging thing for me just to juggle through all of that and because it's it's hard to find a it's hard to have keep a nine to five jobs when you have to stay flexible for auditions and just to balance all that because I worked a lot um, in events so that was what gave me flexibility to um, to keep pursuing my auditions like I tried to keep working like limit my day job my day job hours to nights and weekends and I, I wound up working a lot of crazy hours like we have to work until like two in the morning and we're exhausted and you have to like pull yourself together because you have an audition at 10 in the morning so I think that's just a constant balance it's it's give and take it's a lot of you need to just be okay with being with the uncertainty and just being able to juggle whatever comes at you because it's just you never really know what's going to come at come at you and that's been one of the challenges it's just day by like one day at a time like I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow so <laughs> I always ask my guests you know you uh, you never know who can be listening and chances yeah. are the particular person that's, that's uh, the particular guest that's speaking right now it could be that the audience are, are you know, students who mm -hmm. they want to pursue the same exact uh, career. Tell us what tips do you have? Let's see. Um, this is going to sound so cheesy, but if this is what you really want to do and this is what you love, you have to. Because I've been struggling with this myself, and it's like... It's, it's constantly like a wheel. Like I was just talking to one of my friends who's a healer. Um, she was telling me about the Wheel of Fortune in tarot. It's just sometimes you're gonna be on top of the wheel and sometimes you're gonna be crushed under it and it's a cycle. And we just have to hang in there and even if we don't see where it's going, but if this is like where, if this is what you truly want to do, and this is what makes you excited to get out of bed in the morning, like you have to keep hanging in there because we never know where something's going to lead. And it's also important to know that stages in life, they're all temporary. Like, we're going to have, like, our good times, so, like, try to enjoy that when it's happening. But when we're going through our rougher stages of life, which is anybody, um, we have to remember that 
this will also pass. Like it's con everything's constantly changing. And I think one of the things that I struggle with is just because living an artist's life, it's just we go from one job to the next job, like nothing's ever guaranteed. And just learning how to be okay with that, but also like trusting in yourself and believing in yourself enough that, you know, if you have the passion for something, that is what's going to carry you through, even through the most um, impossible of situations. Like, things will open up. Like, we have to, this is like something I've been telling myself a lot lately, we have to believe that the things that we need will come to us when we need it. It's just, you need to really stick to your guns and hang in there, because it's the same, I feel like, um, marathon running and acting, I feel, have been very similar. I actually feel like marathon running is easier than acting in some ways because marathons, it's 26.2 miles. There's, or any race that you run, there's a given finish line. Like, you know where, that the finish line is there and that you will eventually cross it. You might be, like, injured or you might have thrown up or whatever, but it's like you know you will cross it. And the thing about acting is nobody ever knows. Even the people that we look up to, like the celebrities with these amazing careers, like we, I think it's just learning to live with the uncertainty because you don't know what could happen tomorrow. And just trying to enjoy where you're at, regardless of, you know, what the situation is, because sometimes things are going well, sometimes things are not. It's just, you need to just stick with it. <laughs> Tell us about, you know, the importance of mentors as well. That's been huge, because um, I've gone through, like, I actually had to talk to some of my, some of my um, mentors and just people that I look up to, um, even artists that are, that um, have inspired me and, and they're fairly well established. I think it's really important just to have those types of people that you can talk to who have um, been through where you've been at and you know just to see that you know they they made it to the other side and one day we will too um, it's just very good to be able to have that outlet to talk to somebody so don't be afraid to reach out to people that you admire because um, now like with social media being what it is it's just like if there's like artists or entertainers that you look up to it's you can um, find them on Twitter find them on Instagram and just start connecting with them because it's always awesome to get like because I've gotten like some inspiring messages from people you know and it's just because I've like liked their photos or like I write comments and they, they send me a lot of messages like I wanted to say hi to uh, Tinsel Corey um, she she was She's an amazing actress. Um, she's all over TV and in movies. But like, funnily enough, I was just a fan of hers, and I started following her on Instagram like a year or two ago. But because I've been able to connect with her, she's been really nice about sending me in in inspiring messages, encouraging messages, and I feel like that's something that we should not be shy about. We need to, when we need help or when we need guidance, like don't be afraid to ask for it. There's nothing to be ashamed of needing, like, sorry, there's nothing to be ashamed of when you need help. How about the importance of being bilingual? We hear that a lot. It definitely helps, yeah, because my parents are like, oh, see, look, you should have paid attention when we were trying to, like, teach you Chinese, because now you get Chinese auditions, and it's like, mom, help me, panic, or something. But it can definitely help, especially now, since uh, there's, like, a push for diversity and, and just to be able to cross over, like, the more the, like the more skills that you have it's the more opportunities that are be that'll be open to you because when you go into auditions a lot of the time it's going to be people that like they look similar to you and everything is pretty much you know we need as much as we can to be able to stand out from that what are some of your favorite like uh like uh films actors and uh, tv shows Okay, let's see. People are going to be making fun of me for it, but like some of my friends are listening, so I have to be honest. Um, my two favorite movies were Titanic and <laughs> Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, and I think part of it was just growing up 
that was my outlet. Like when I was struggling in school, uh, my mom would always say, oh, well, hurry up and get through this test. Hurry up and finish your homework and we'll go see Leonardo DiCaprio's favorite movie. And I was like, that's kind of, uh, his newest movie, sorry. Um, that's kind of how I fell in love with the whole idea of movie making and acting because it's just, you get to go to a theater and forget your problems for two hours. and. It's like, it's magical because you're like in a whole different place and it's just whatever the film, it's whatever world the film has created, the directors, the actors, and that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of what keeps me in when um, we go through like the rougher side of the business, like when we go through a lot of rejection or the slower parts, like I try to like connect to like the magic of that and that's what keeps me inspired. And when I told my mom I wanted to be an actress, she was like, okay, she went to the library and she was like, she rented all of Audrey Hepburn's movies because she's like, if you're going to be an actress, be a good one. And it's like, I'm not saying you have to be exactly like her, but you know, just study because she's one of like the great ones out there and I just fell in love with Breakfast at Tiffany, like, I watch it so many times. <laughs> yeah. I know that when, uh, like, taking broadcasting, mm -hmm. like, uh, one of the things that they would tell us for, like, uh, exercises of, like, reading commercials is mm -hmm. that, what was it? Was it, the P's pop and the S, and, like, certain syllables, like, mm -hmm. they would, like, pop out, I guess, when, like, there's a microphone. Like, yeah. Um, was there ever like stuff that they would like tell you? Um, I mean, when I took commercial commercial classes, um, what they would always stress is when we get commercial copy, um, the most important thing is to get the product name right. Obviously, like say that really clearly and just put a really positive spin on that because that's what you're trying to sell. But as far as I mean, when I when I've done ADR or stuff like that. I remember when, I do remember something, I'm like, my memory's kind of like, if it serves correctly, um, when we are doing like the P and the S sounds in front of a microphone, like not to do it too much, because like you said, it's like, it's going to like cause an echo or something, and to be, like to ha be a safe dif distance from the microphone. <laughs> yeah. I, I always have fun with, with this. I don't know, it's becoming a segment that I, sometimes <laughs> I, I end up saying, uh, you know, do you have any food stories? Because I know that, like in acting, like mm -hmm. sometimes you can have multiple takes and you're yeah. like eating like something. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I did a project a couple years ago. Um, it was really interesting because we were um, it was supposed to like look like we were shooting inside um, an um, an igloo with a family of Eskimos, and it was like actually out in the valley, and it was like 100 degrees, and we had to wear these like giant parkas, and it was like really hot. But um, they, one of the foods that they tried to recreate was whale blubber, because I think um, cold Alaskan climate, they had to eat that just to stay warm. And I was like horrified. I was like, is this actual whale blubber? But it was actually like oatmeal that they colored pink. And we had to eat that, and I was like, um, it, didn't, it didn't taste really good. But most of the times when I've had to eat or things, like, it's involved food, um, most of the times I've been really lucky. Like, that's the only time I remember. I was, like, trying to eat fake whale blubber, and it was just basically oatmeal dyed pink. Like, luckily we didn't have to eat it too much, but they were like, if you need to spit it out, it's okay. And then on the flip side, um, Going back to um, Three Chen Sisters, like our latest episode, we shot a Thanksgiving episode and it was like a dream come true because they ordered all this delicious like Thanksgiving food and traditional Asian dishes, like stuff that I was so excited to eat, stuff that I grew up with. And it was just once we got, once we got the shot and once everything, everything was taken care of, like they let us go to town and we got to like eat everything and that's like, that's also fun. <laughs> Tell us about the stories about, you know, like landing, you know, your biggest roles, how they happen. Uh, let's see. Well, um, this is a good question. Um, I guess the two, my two, I mean the two roles that are dearest to my heart right now, um, I, I was just really lucky because um, they're, they're, going, they're going to film festivals uh, next month. Actually, we were screening Three Chen Sisters uh, this Thursday at Silicon Beach. And I was really lucky because I had just, I knew the director, Elaine Wong, like um, I was part of um, 
a program, a Shanghai Tech program, a couple years ago, uh, USC, um, they housed a very talented group of filmmakers from Shanghai. They just wanted to come here and learn about the ins and outs of filmmaking and in Los Angeles. And I worked on some of their films there, and that's when I met Elaine. And I was just really lucky because last year she just approached me. She's like, I wrote this script. Like, would you be interested in working on it? And it happened to be Three Chen Sisters. And also um, Destroyed by Fire, a comedy pilot that I worked on. And it's been nominated. It's won, it's won at festivals. And it's also screening next month at the Independent Filmmakers Showcase. Like, that was such a blessing because, again, I, it goes back to um, my acting coach, Amy Linden. Um, her manager was helping to cast the production, and she read the script, and she saw the role. Um, I play an intern kid, and she was just like, she said that she saw, she could hear my voice, and she could see me in this role. And so she called me. Um, she got me the audition, and they contacted my manager, and I was just so blessed because I remember that that day I had just gotten off work like at two in the morning and like I was sleeping when she was called like she called me like repeatedly that day just to get me to answer the phone she's like you need to make this audition like you have to make this audition and it's just back to um, relationship building and who you know it's just like I was so blessed to have these two people looking out for me and uh, tell us also you know in case people are also interested is tell us about extras Oh, well, that's actually a very, I mean, if you want to learn just how film sets are run and just to get your feet wet, like that's, there's um, agencies that you can sign up with. Like I haven't done extra work in a really long time, but I think it's central casting and it's just, you, 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 you um, get signed up in their database, they take some photos of you and then it's like, I, they'll send you, um, They'll send you stuff that, because they constantly need extras here in L.A. because they're shooting so many movies, um, so many TV shows. Like, they'll send you the notices and see if you're available. Um, it's a really good way just to learn. And it's, you know, it could, it's, it's long hours, but, you know, you bring a book and, you know, you just, you can sit there and you can read. And then they'll call you when you're needed. And it's a good way to network and to get your feet wet and just to meet people. Ooh. Um, what's been the best advice you you know you've received? This um, it's a really really good question. Um, the best advice uh, this actually happened a couple weeks ago. Um, we were getting some uh, we were getting some backlash when we released one of our episodes, Three um, Chen Sisters, because we dealt with interracial dating and that's a very touchy subject and. So we were getting a lot of like mean-spirited messages from people and I reached out to one of my mentors and he just told me because he's, um, he's a very established musician but he told me you can't place your self-worth on other people's opinions of you and you just need to stick to your guns and do what makes you happy and believe in what you're doing because there's going to be people that are going to love what you do and they're going to hate what you do and it's just as long as it's coming from a very genuine place in your heart you need to stick to that but yeah basically it's just and it's very easy to fall into that trap um, especially as an actress because it's just like we go to auditions we go to meetings and it's like I hope I you know we hope that we book the role and we hope that they like you know it's just like oh I hope they like me I hope they like me and it's like really easy to like fall into like this trap of like people pleasing and it's just when you're too accommodating you end up losing yourself and it's just yeah people don't get to decide how much you're worth and it's been an ongoing process just to be able to hang on to that and to preserve that just to know that you know we there's only one of us in this whole world like that's our superpower nobody will get to be you as well as you can be you and to trust in what we are able to bring and bring to the table and to believe in that so yeah <laughs> have any of your roles required you to see uh, let's see I mean I've had to audition for audition for roles where I had to sing and I just prayed and I prayed to God and I, <laughs> I mean none of my roles have required me to sing well I've had to sing badly for certain things which is like fine <laughs> yeah. like what what songs did you try I, I, I auditioned for um, this one film 
last year, and they had me sing a song in Chinese, and I was like so panicked. I ended up singing this song that my mom sang to me a really long time ago, like what we sang, what she sang to me growing up, and yeah, I don't even remember all of the lyrics anymore. <laughs> Um, how about, like, uh, has there ever been, like, a role where all of a sudden, like, they've required you to do something, like, drastic, like, maybe you get, like, uh, a piercing, or, or, um, or they end up, like, putting, like, what is that stuff called? Temporary tattoos? Like, I mean, I have actual process. tattoos, and, like, they've had to cover them for certain roles, but, um, I, I, I was lucky, like, nothing, nothing super drastic, I mean... Even when I had to play the heavy dramatic roles and we had to look like we were beat up or like whatever, it was mostly, it was just makeup. We I've always been lucky to have very talented makeup artists on set. Like they do most of the magic. So yeah, I don't think I've had to do anything super drastic, like shave my head or something like that. Or, yeah. How about yeah. special effects makeup? Uh, let's see. Think back. I mean, I think the extent of special effects makeup on me, it was just like bruises or whatever, because I've had to play beat up and dead people and just to make us, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, one of the movies I worked on, Street Kings, um, Keanu Reeves and Forrest Whitaker, um, the makeup artist was apologizing to me because she was like, oh, this is one of your first big movies. I'm so sorry I couldn't, like, make you pretty and, like, make you beautiful because, like, in that scene we were, like, kidnapped kidnapped kids that um, gangsters are trying to sell into a human trafficking ring. So it's just, like, they had to, like, it was really funny because they got out the curling irons and everything, to, but they didn't curl our hair to make it look pretty. They tried to make it look, like, all crazy, like we had been held hostage for, like, three days and whatnot and it was just painting on the bruises and I was just like it's it's fun I'm like <laughs> well we are down to our final like three minutes but uh do you have any closing statements to our audience um I mean thank you thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for having me um wanted to say hi to my three Chen sisters family because they're listening now they knew I was nervous so thank you for the support and also Eric Leslie uh, Millie and Vivian, thank you also. <laughs> and now, uh, can this be accessed on like YouTube, or how do they find the the series? Oh, so um, if you let's see, so for Three Chen Sisters, we are actually screening our third episode at Silic the Silicon Beach Film Festival this Thursday. It's at the Howard Hughes Promenade. Um, if you look me up on Instagram, the link to get tickets for that um, it's in my bio and. Also, May 9th at the Independent Filmmaker Showcase. Um, we're going to be at The Grove. Um, the pilot, Destroyed by Fires, directed by Michael Sanchez, um, written by Franco Cooper. Very talented people. That's actually going to be screening at 345. And then Three Chen Sisters will also be screening again at 4.30 p.m. Um, it's at The Grove. Uh, I'll, I'll be posting everything um, on my social media, so if people want to come out and check it out, we would love to have you. We have two minutes, but I do want to address sure. also rejection. If people get rejected, it like what is interesting to me is it happens at every stage of your career, even like people that you look look up to. Because um, one of uh, one of my other favorite actresses, um, Alex Breckenridge, she is on um, This Is Us right now. But what I really admired about her was like I was following her on social media, and she said, um, you know, I went on 35 auditions, and these are like the scripts that she laid out on the floor, and she's like, I got called it, I booked five of them, and it's just rejection happens, and it's like it's something that I struggle with a lot constantly. Like we just have to work really hard and not getting le letting it get us down because a lot of times you can be the best actor in the room and still not book it because of there's like so many reasons why you may or may not book something and it's just we need to trust that we go out there like and just worry about what you can control we can control about what we put into it and just doing the best job possible and then just let it go and trust that you did your best if you didn't book it like doesn't mean that you're not a good actor or anything like that. It's just you can't let that get you down, and it's not um, an accurate representation of your abilities or where you are in your career. So just always believe in yourself and you know trust trust in your abilities. 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The Golden Spotlight. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this episode. Until next time, folks. Hey, oh my gosh. <laughs>